being in a better frame of mind, exercising, eating right, being calm, stress, yeah. all of that changes things physiologically that make your whole body better at fighting cancer. That we, we agree on, that's measured. Now, let's go back to the brain. I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. Really? <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis House. You've worked as a brain surgeon and neuroscientist for, for a while now, and so you're an expert on all things the brain and also the mind. Which Trying is, to be. Which I think is kind of fascinating. Yeah. Or you're in, in a constant studying process of it. I'm curious, the first question I have is, what do you think is the, the biggest factor, since you've studied both the brain and the mind, what is the biggest factor that holds us back from thinking in terms of abundance and thinking in terms of positivity? Why do we stay stuck on negative thinking, negative thoughts, and limited mindset so much? Yeah, that's a big question. So uh, the simple answer is that the um, stories we've been told about what's going on in our skull Mm -hmm. They're just wrong. Interesting. Okay, so the first thing is there's no wires. We're not hardwired. There are no gears. So let's go backwards. Way back when, like ancient Egypt, they thought it was just like flan or something. The soul <laughs> was in the heart. And I believe, you know, I, I can see that. I, I've opened chest before for cardiac surgery and it's fierce. And what they would do is stick a straw up the nose and slurp out the brain, just get rid of it. So for a while, I could understand. Uh -huh the complete misunderstanding. Then when sort of like, you know, speakeasies and industrial revolution, all the pictures about, about the brain, you see them as gears. Mm -hmm. And But modern time, we're starting to think about it as wired. I'm wired for this, I'm wired for that. You're not wired for anything. It's an ecosystem filled with throbbing 100 billion microscopic jellyfish, sparking electricity at each other, trying to approach each other, shaving down, pruning, branching, arborizing. So when I use those words like arborization, pruning, those are neuroscience words in rigorous neuroscience journals. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't sort of made it to pop culture. So I think part of what keeps us stuck is that we think, oh, I'm wired this way or I have to rewire. And it's too on-off rather than flows, mm. right? It's not... Um, freeway from A to B, it's the way you see a school of birds flow, uh -huh. and they roll over each other, aurora borealis. That's how thoughts and that's how feelings float through the ether of our minds. When you start to understand it like that, then you know every day something new is possible. Is it easy? No, but it's possible. Wow. So that's the, that's the real way to think of your brain, mind, and behavior that it's completely plastic in the sense that you're uh, never the same person just from a moment ago since we've met. Mm. That's a good introduction to this. I'm curious because you, you do surgeries on a weekly basis mm -hmm. where you open the skull, mostly the top of the skull, well, all different areas. It's like ice fishing, so we make Take holes spots out. different. Wherever we need to get, we make the hole gotcha. underneath it so we can get there. So it may not be a full top of the skull. No, that's off. in Hannibal Lecter's yes, movie. Yes. <laughs> so you're taking little, 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 yeah. little holes. The slickest brain surgeons, meaning who can do it the best, make the smallest hole uh, to get right where you need to, the smallest incision, and, and do the most, uh, you know... The least amount of uh, damage, I guess, to the whole skull. Have you ever had to take off the, the top, the whole top? No, but in trauma, after boxing, sports, car accidents, sometimes we take off two big pancake sizes on the left and right. Really? So when the brain is throbbing, the release. This, yeah, you take the lid off. Really? But you don't take the whole thing off because you've got a giant vein coming down the middle. So that's, you can't do the mohawk part. So you take two strips. The sides. Yeah. So if you look at, when I travel through South America, you look at the trephinations, the holes in the skulls. They're always on the side. You can't make holes in the middle and still live. Really? A giant vein splitting the two hemispheres. Oh, so that's just in the movies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's uh, <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. Right, exactly. Uh, but that's a good question, though. That there's a it's a targeted approach. Interesting. Okay. You want the patient to feel it the least. And right. Wake of course. Up the best. Right. Of course. What did you? What's been one of the biggest realizations from studying neuroscience, but also studying the brain mm -hmm. and actually opening up pieces of the skull? looking in there, surgically doing things yeah. to optimize it. What was one of a big aha moment for you of studying both areas where you're like, wow, there's something that I didn't think was possible that is actually possible for human beings to do? Yeah. Is there question. anything? Yeah, a really good question. It ties back to your first question yeah. about what holds us back. So the thing that shocked me was 
that we could actually remove parts of the brain and people would go home a week later. I'm not saying there isn't some subtle neuropsychiatric issue, but for example, I had a guy come in, he's a framer, and you know, they have the, the pneumatic, you know, it's not hammer and nails as yeah. many people conceive it to be, but poom, poom, poom. Yes. And a lot of times when a real co- recoils back, they'll pop a nail through their orbit or nose oh. into their frontal lobe. This happened. And they drive in. They have With a nail in their yeah. brain? Right. So that's the first Come thing on. I was like, wait, it's, no, no, totally. I got pictures on my phone that we're not going to show anybody, but you can have a penetrating injury to certain parts of the brain. Of the brain, and you drive in. Holy cow. So I, that, so that's the first thing I realized was, so there isn't a, a region in the brain for creativity. There isn't a region in the brain for this. So the first thing I had to realize was, no, this thing is working in, in a, as an environment, as an ocean filled with like a kelp forest and jellyfish. So if you drop something into the ocean, you're not going to disrupt. The, there's no spot for something. And that ties back to what, you know, what I want people to walk away with is that you have to think of your thoughts and feelings and the working of your flesh inside your skull as a, as a garden, as an ecosystem. Just because you have one weed or one spike doesn't mean the harmony is disrupted. So, wow. for example, one frontal lobe we can surgically remove if needed after trauma or tumor. And patients function. They drive. They talk on the phone. Again, you don't want this. Uh, one occipital lobe doesn't leave you blind. It's that uh, people think occipital lobe blindness. No. If I take out a tumor from the right occipital lobe, I just can't trust my left rear view mirror when I drive. It's a f- it's a field cut. Your world goes from this to this. So I, when I when I first started seeing that, because I assumed you hit any part of the brain, it's your dust. Because people will say, like, the left side of the brain is for this, and the right side of the brain is for this. And no. I use more of the right side of my brain, no. and that's why I'm creative or whatever it is. Or I'm more analytical no. because I use this side of the brain. Or my my fear-based side of the brain yeah. is, is no. heightened. So, no. so no. you're saying if one no. part of the brain is under attack, tumor, trauma, I don't know, a nail, whatever mm-hmm. it is, something happens to that part of the brain, it may not hold you back from your creativity or your critical thinking potentially no, no. it because the rest of your brain can compensate now mm-hmm. let me give you now that's not true for the entire brain so let me just go backwards a little bit but those were the aha moments i had i mean i'd been i'd seen bowels i'd taken care of patients aids was you know going crazy in the 80s i'd seen a lot the first time i saw somebody do brain surgery i was like is that possible first like it, can you even remove the skull and they're like, yeah. And then they were, you know, can you remove that tissue to get to the tumor? They're like, yeah. You just have to understand how the whole thing works globally in harmony. Now, the way I think of the brain is like a mushroom. And so you've got the canopy. And all the magic and the thoughts spark from the top, the surface. Mm-hmm. And then they send things down to the stalk, which comes, you know, deep to your mouth and comes out of the bottom of your skull and, and then turns in your spinal cord. Wow. So if when I want to move my left hand, my right brain says, move your left hand, it sends down signals, they come under my armpit, they come into this nerve, that's and that's crazy. what happens, right? Now, so what though, that, what those this? lower parts, they, there is some, you hit that, you lose something. Something down here. The reptilian brain, the spinal cord, down every same, millimeter uh, does something, because it's a lot of, think of it as cables, even though it's not wires, but there are a lot of, we call them tracts, T-R-A-C-T-S. There are a lot of tracks that are communicating the things that the canopy mm. thought of. And in that area, if there's a nail injury, you do get a certain deficit. But in your thinking, your feeling, your emotions, your love, your fear, it's not a fear spot or a love spot. It's, huh. it, it's sort of, again, the aurora borealis and the worlds of... Of a, of a school of birds just wow. flowing in, in different energy, right? Or so that's fish, a school yeah, of fish or something. Fish, yeah, 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 exactly. That's fascinating. So that's that's I, I want people to walk away with. Okay, so what that leaves people with is the fear I have is real, but it's not fixed. It's mm-hmm. not wired. It's not permanent. And through effort, through exposure therapy, through whatever it is, whatever your process is, that 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 school of fish can flow in a different way. That's, to me, that's, that's infinitely powerful, that we wow. are new every day. That also gives us the responsibility to hold on to our positive attributes. Right. That we can spiral away every day, and we can, we can spiral downward, and we can spiral upward any day. Wow. 
And so have you studied brains where someone came in at one point and then maybe a year or five years later you saw them again and mm. you were able to look inside their brain? Another good question. And what did you see different um, with the brain? I wonder, can we enhance our brain by the way we think and our behaviors mm. and our actions and our and the way we love ourselves and mm. treat ourselves internally and emotionally? Um, or can we hurt our brain by doing the opposite? Uh, that's, a, that's a profound question. So again, let me start with a, a very sort of um, dramatic example to set the point to the, yes. the larger takeaway. <clears throat> On occasion, for epilepsy that shuts down kids, we have to actually take away half of the brain. It's called a hemi, you know, hemispherectomy. You have to take out half we the brain. We remove we, it's, you got everybody can Google it. This is not, it's not like it's something we invented to, today. It's been going on for decades, yet because a lot of the people in this space are, are not actual brain surgeons, we're not getting a lot of those stories from there. But there's a tremendous story there that when there's a medical need and the parents ask for it and it helps the child, we can actually make a big incision and take away a frontal lobe, a parietal lobe, an occipital lobe that's sparking um, seizures. And when they wake up, that left side doesn't work. Mm. Three years later, when you see them, no way. Yeah, this this is not even sci-fi. They can move. They can function fully yeah. again. So the remaining hemisphere can reorganize. Huh. The linebacker can also be the defensive end. Sure. Can also be sometimes even on offense. There are different roles those neurons really? can play. Yeah. So the and how do we know that? Because you've removed half the brain and it's still functioning. And we took a picture three years later and that half a brain was still gone. Still gone? Yeah. It didn't sprout back. It's not like a liver where we cut half of it off and the mom really? grows some back, you take a chunk of it and you put in the kid. So that part is still missing. Gone. Yet that function has returned. That's crazy. So that's what I mean about different players on the team can cover for each other. So I want people to know that, that that's true plasticity and it's not rewiring, it's not regrowing, it's actually whatever you have is repurposed. And how do they do that? Well, through the electrical flows of the mind. There's, um, wow. That's, and that's, so not the electrical flows of the brain. Right. The electrical flows of the mind. Of the mind. So what, what is people are like, okay, now he's gone. <laughs> now he's, 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 got, he's selling crystals in Malibu. No, 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 stay with me. Um, when you walk, well, you played, right? And we uh -huh. talked about that briefly. I didn't know that about you. It's yeah. fascinating. I think there are a lot of parallels with surgeons and uh, athletes. Mm -hmm. I think surgeons want to be athletes when <laughs> yeah. they became surgeons. Yes. The, um, when you walk up to a stadium, there's every single, you know, so I was at uh, SoFi. That's it's incredible. Was, no, I've been there. It's unbelievable. I don't think people understand. It's, it's the world's largest pit. You come in near the top because of the LAX yes. flight path. And I, you come in and, and you look down. They dug like, deep. Oh, I know. It's, it's amazing. It's good to be in my hometown. Yeah. When you walk up and you hear, you, you see, well, you see the pieces, 70,000 fans. Think of those as neurons. We have 100 billion. Uh, those little magical sparks from the jellyfish that I described, because they look like that. They're not squares. So you can talk, you can, people are talking and moving. That's how people conceive or conceptualize the brain. Um, but what happens when they, they roar together? That's what I mean about the electricity of There's the mind. There's an energy. Right. There's an energy. You feel it. It's an epiphenomenon. Okay. Now you now let's build an engine. The parts are there. You fire it up. And there's a hum, right? That's more than just the engine and the pistons. Uh, a symphony. You've got the musicians. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm less familiar with this, but they create something bigger. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean about the mind, that it's not a... It's not a forward, backward electricity zinging around on wires. It's that thing that happens when you have a hundred billion um, throbbing, growing, wow. branching neurons, and it's electricity based. You can put a sticker on and light a, a small light bulb. Really? Yeah. And so that's how we measure for. Have you done seizures. this before? Oh yeah, but this is but this is decades old. This yes, isn't like. Yes. So what I want people to say is like understand is. When we remove the right hemisphere and the patient comes back three years later, kids, and they can function again, no new wire sprouted. Nothing was spliced. What remained created a new roar, 
created a new hum, created, you know, recovered the function. So it's wow. not always easy for people to understand, but that's the truth. And that's our current understanding of how the brain leads to the mind. Wow. Yeah. Can the brain function without the mind? If you get knocked down a ring, you're not thinking. Right. And if we put electrodes, there's dampened electricity, but that stalk, remember I mentioned the mushroom, uh -huh. that can still keep you breathing and protect your airway and keep your heart still going. So the reptilian areas of the brain, the ones that we share with many animals, will function, will function without a mind, without that, if you equate Conscious. mind with consciousness, thought, love, emotion. Wow. So, so it's like so the it can, babushka dolls where you have So it can function, stock. but it's not... It's not, uh, it's, it's baseline function. Yeah, it's not, keeping you all breathing. Not high level cognitive function that we So the deploy. mind is really what's keeping everything activated. That's what, yeah. That's in concert. Right. Right. The mind can think down the heart rate that the reptilian brain right. keeps going if you get knocked out. So they're, they're integrated. Uh, and so you put it nicely, the mind can keep things going. Um, but... If you have brain death, then there's no mind. There's no electricity. The By brain... Brain death, so unfortunately. What's that mean? Meaning uh, sometimes the heart, the body's alive, but the brain has died. How, how does that happen? Well, well, we get into some... some. I think it's important for people to understand. So car accidents, uh -huh. brain swelling, those 100 billion neurons, they burst from smashing into each other. Mm. We, we put a, a catheter in the thigh and we, we score it die, and we see there's no blood going into the skull. Oh. It's, it's a dark vault. So if your brain so much has- swelling, If it's yeah. so much swelling, the blood can't flow. There's so much inflammation that right. it's hard for blood to flow. So instead of a heart attack, you've had a complete brain attack. Can you recover? And for a day, no, no, no. You the, can't recover from this? Not even miracles. When you've it's 100.00 100. out, there's never anything left. But for a, for a day, the, since the heart nerves have their own pulse. Yes, they're pumping. They, 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 when we can put machines and things and to keep people going for a day or so, that's where the world of organ transplantation comes in. So a lot of, lot of guys or a lot of people who uh, ride motorcycles, they have that kind of injury and their, or, their bodily organs are healthy and they, they often are you know, the ones that provide transplants for other, other people. The brain is, brain is not death, functioning. Body is alive. Really? So in that setting, there's no mind. There's no electricity coming out. So when you're asking Got it. about mind and brain. Um, and so that's a fascinating area for people to know those examples, to understand themselves better, mm -hmm. right? And it comes back to that we are electrical currents. We're not wires. We're not switches. We're mm -hmm. not gears. spots. We're not gears. Electrical currents. Yeah, they're flows. That's what, the, what is that? So like uh, you go to a lake and... You drop a big, you jump in there, whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a wave that moves through the lake. Uh -huh. But the water molecules didn't ride with it. Right. Right? Right. So that's the, the hum, the symphony, uh -huh. the roar, the electrical global waves that are pulsating through our brains. And when people say they're in the zone or they're mm -hmm. in a flow state or they're in a meditative state, that, that global energy flow, those waves... They're different. They can be measured and categorized. Really? Right? Yeah. So what, does that, what does that mean when someone's in a flow state in terms of the mind-brain connection? What is happening? Yeah. Are these 100 billion jellyfish like no. in symphony and they're yeah. humming at a high level? Well, they're well, working in concert? Let me together? jump in right there. Actually, that's perfect. Actually, you would think that if somebody's about to hit a game-winning shot, their best performance is when they're at a high level, meaning wild, frenetic. Actually, no. When they're super calm. Somewhere in between. Okay. So, so not asleep. Right. But not, hey, I'm on my third espresso just taking in stuff in the but morning. Focused. Focused, but relaxed. And there is a measured state for that. And it usually has to do with sort of medium brain waves. That's something I'm writing about right now. And, hmm. and whether you meditate or you're under that you, the two minute drill in football, or you're a ballerina and you have that that perfect you know dance routine coming up or maneuver. Um, you are actually disengaging some of the things that would get in the way of you releasing a performance. So you're not thinking the performance; you're getting out of the way. You're, you're being. You're just yeah. Interesting. And and that has a different 
measurable electrical flow state, you know, and it's not revved up. It's not it's, hyperactive. It's somewhere in between above calm, but calm. Yeah. It's not fifth gear. It's not idle. Yeah. They're at their best. And they've seen that in athletes and different things. What's like the that. fastest way for a human being to get into a flow state? Uh, for that, in my opinion, there are no shortcuts because what, what it takes is a lot of practice mm -hmm. and it takes is a, a lot of learning. And then when you are performing... And being confident in your abilities and yeah. Yeah, but it's executing, you know, I, I don't think you can get into, I might be wrong, but when I see my kids, I don't think you can get into a flow state just rolling through Instagram. Right. Yeah. It, it's actually delivering a skill you've trained for. Mm. So you have a craft that you've trained for and you're performing it at a high level. So you see race car drivers talking about stuff like that. So it is sort of a, a, your craft perform just at the edge of your comfort level. Mm. Like video games, if they're too hard, kids will check out. If they're too easy, they'll check out. So something about, it tends to be a physical maneuver. I always find that fascinating where, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can think, I guess you could think yourself into one of those states, but you see it a lot with people who do a, a physical task that's challenging, rewarding, something they're engaged in, and at the level of their performance. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, it's a two-minute drill at the end of a football yeah, of game. Of course, probably. yeah. It's go time, man. Yeah. Did you play football? No, I love sports, though, because yeah. I think there are a lot of parallels. Yeah, of course. Uh, the challenging thing is, I don't know if I'd, I don't have kids, but I don't know if I'd let my kids play football mm. after all the all head trauma you know. that I took. I mean, every day we were just taught back in the late 90s to just lead with the head, hit with the head. Now it's illegal. You can't hit the head at Monday all. Monday Night Football used to open so up with the two helmets. Crashing, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. And the trauma that, you know, I feel like yeah. I've had to heal for the last 15, 18 years now. I don't know if it's worth it. I think, I guess if you're not hitting the head anymore, it's different, but there's still going to be clashing. I mean, I got a couple of thoughts about that. I mean, one thing that I didn't like about it was I think they knew this was bad for us yeah. and they kept trying to hide it from us. So, mm, of say, course. Hey, just tell us it's bad. Just tell yeah. us smoking's bad. We know mm. boxing's bad. Nobody goes into boxing and says, I didn't know. Yeah. But you, you held information uh, that... You know, traumatic yeah. head injury in football was sort of messing people up. Yeah. That's that's one of my things with it. On the other side is if it if it's something you love and it's an opportunity for you to advance in your life, mm -hmm. who am I to say no? As long as the risks are made aware. Like, yeah. hey, uh, if you banged your knee against the wall 30 times a day for 10 years, <laughs> your knee's going to be jacked up. Yeah. It's no different for your brain. Got it. I still want to play. Uh -huh. As You know what I mean? It's more of about course. that to me. Not, we all live in different Yes. Worlds and safety and yeah. risk and what's what's um My sons didn't play though. Uh, they could have, but they didn't. They didn't. Yeah, yeah. They played flag and they all played baseball. Yeah, it's probably safer. So the, the brain has the ability to heal from traumatic from trauma then. Mm -hmm. Physical and emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like the emotional hidden trauma mm -hmm. can be more painful and harder to recover for some, the psychological, emotional trauma, than the physical trauma. You can you can see it and you can treat the physical trauma in a sense, but depending on how intense it is, but the emotional, psychological hidden traumas, I feel like are invisible and people don't think they need to treat it because they don't see a broken arm and say, I yeah. need to go to the doctor because my, my bone is sticking out. Let me put a splint on it and, and heal it up. We're not trained that way. Mm. There is no easy answer. Yeah. But what, what I will say is that um, trauma, this is just these are my concepts. They're not, I'm not. Yes. There's therapeutic trauma. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is resetting a bone after it's broken, mm -hmm. the pain of a cancer surgery, but then you know that your cancer's been cut out. Like, that, that's good pain. Right. Uh, and we're just talking about physical trauma. Yes. Then there's emotional trauma. If, when, if people are attacked, that's also intimately connected to emotional trauma, right? So the the people who don't have memory after certain uh, injuries or operations, they never have PTSD because they don't remember it. Mm. So the emotional context and memories huh. related to trauma, be it emotional, physical, or a combination, requires memory. That's cool, right? I like to think yes. about, like, just as a concept, I don't have a solution for... I don't, hey, don't do these three things, you'll be better. Sort of not my approach, because when people did that with me, I was like, how do you know what I'm going through, man? 
You look at me, you think everything's good. Are you sure? Are you sure I wasn't attacked last night? Are you sure I didn't find out that my patient didn't do well last night? Are you sure I didn't find out a loved one was diagnosed with something? You know, like, I just don't want to put people in, the, uh, in, in boxes. In fact, I want people to know that they are new every day. You're, I'm, I'm not even the same uh, version of myself I was before the last few years. How can I be understood as a, a, a group of people, a mm. man or a surgeon? You know, I just want people to think as, of each other as individuals yes. and dynamic. That said, uh, I never judge people's trauma to be better or worse. People are looking or, or stronger or justified. Uh, they're looking at everybody's going to have a traumatic event in their life, whether it's a car crash or hearing. There's, it's unavoidable. It's partly because we put ourselves out there. It's partly because the way we approach the world is to be completely um, adaptive, mm -hmm. right? If we're rigid, then there's less chances for trauma, but, but that's a life less well lived. So when you put yourself out there, traumatic experiences are unavoidable. Right. That said, okay? So that said, yeah, you but get a I'm, bruise what I'm hearing you, you say is, But what I'm hearing you say is that if we don't have the memory of the traumatic event, we don't have PTSD. We don't have, tra right. we don't have a trauma yeah. detail. Right, so that, that's, the, that's the concept that, people, that I want people to walk away and say, memory is important. Oh, memory is the thing that determines whether the event remains traumatic in your whether heart. Whether it's painful mind. still for Very you. Good. So let's get into that. So we just need to heal the memory right. of the trauma. This is exactly where I'm taking it. Um, very good. The, so memories are not uh, files in a cabinet. And actually, in the we, brain. Well, how, yeah. well, how is memory categorized? Well, again, it's, there are some regions that we, if we remove them, you would lose memory. But memory's not only there, it relies on pulling from memories of smell to new... Like, for example, smell is very interesting. It's one of the five senses that we can't tamp down with our thinking. So the, the perfume or cologne, smell and memory are intimately intertwined. Wow. And so you're pulling from all different parts of the brain. Again, memory is a certain electrical flow in the brain. Um, but it's not... It's malleable. It's moldable. Just because you have a certain memory today doesn't mean that that experience, good or bad, will remain good or bad. Our, po our positive uh, vibe right now can be made negative. Our negative vibe right now can be made positive as we look back at our day today. Really? So when you see memory that way, then you, then you say, okay, wait a second. Huh. Uh, I was attacked or I was hurt or something really traumatized me. And when I think of it, when I smell that smell when i see that color i'm uh, i'm re traumatized again i clench up i, I have like up. stress or fear yeah. anxiety yeah so the emotional huh. uh, the emotional context to a memory is what you can change you don't want to you, you don't want dementia you don't want to yeah. delete the memory because that's a different problem yeah you don't want to block it you don't want yeah but you what you want to do is change the emotional context attached to that memory what happens if we you hear this from people a lot who might have been traumatized as, as kids, where they forget, they kind of block the memory, and then they remember. When it resurfaces, it's a, they resurfaces. Still raw. It's very raw. Yeah. But they've stuffed it. They've blocked it. They've numbed it, addicted, addicted it, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. Driven it to addiction. But yeah, exactly. So, the, so what happens when? I don't know. I, I don't know about the the kid mm -hmm. stuff as much because mm -hmm. that that's a different space, gotcha. and I don't want to, you know, I want to stay where I feel real comfortable sure. with what I've been reading and learning. So emotional context to memory for adults um, in the right setting with the right person through, you know, they have their techniques. You can actually work through the trauma of the memory and the experience by going to certain therapists who help you get better with that. To so process the memory. Yeah, just to take, take the emotional pain, right, the yeah. emotional trauma and dampen that. So you can say, for example, yeah, I was, you know, I'm, I'm just bringing examples from my world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when I was, I was diagnosed with cancer. That's a traumatic event. And then you see my, my patients, you see them over time through different ways. When they say, they say, I was, you know, I was diagnosed with cancer and I did this. It, you, their face is different describing it later than it was immediately after receiving the diagnosis. So mm. through that, that, that that's a real life example, right? I'm not. Yes. It doesn't have to be all the stuff. Uh, 
you know, related to violence and all that. Sure. The traumatic experience of a cancer diagnosis and how patients cope with that immediately. And then you see them months later, years later, because I'd be a mess, right? I'd be like, okay, this is, I wouldn't be able to cope. But they, surprisingly, not some of them, most of them cope. They get dressed, they come in for their three-month scans, which to me would be a, a traumatic experience every time. Is this guy going to tell me it's back or it's bigger? I mean, think about it, like getting that, getting that thing in your mail oh or email. Like, I got to go in for this Scary. news again. Yeah. But somehow they cope. And that's where in, in Life on a Knife's Edge, I learned so much from them that it's possible to cope with traumatic experiences. I'm not saying you as an individual can. I'm not saying I can. But when you look at a group of cancer patients... And most of them wow. cope, live, move on from very traumatic uh, emotional experiences as well as physical experience of cancer pain and cancer surgery, right? That's the lesson I want everybody to go through um, in their mind when they're dealing with their own challenges. Wow. What's the biggest lessons you've learned from the cancer patients you've treated on the way they process and handle their journey from first hearing about they have cancer in the brain or a tumor or something to recovery. What's the biggest lessons you've learned there? It doesn't all end well. Really? Some, some suffer. Um, many suffer, you know, in their own ways. So it's not this, you know, nobody wishes cancer upon somebody else or on, on you know. So it's not like, you know, it's not like this thing like, it's not an opportunity. In, I don't want to ever present it that way. But those that have coped well, they invariably say, I wish I would have lived my, lived my life the way I am now after a cancer diagnosis. Oh, man. Like, I wish I would have lived my life having seen the finish line relatively because it changes how they live. And they're not sad. As a generalization, like I said, some have suffered. Many have suffered. But... They, they wish that they would have made quality of life a priority throughout life, not after the cancer diagnosis. Mm. Something about seeing the finish line on the horizon makes people go, oh, I don't like that guy. I'm not going to see him much. Right. This is something I enjoy. I want to, you know, they get, they get, they get after it. They get, to, they get to the business of living in the way they want to deep down inside but often have been encumbered by the, the weirdness of wow. interpersonal relationships society and, and career and society. Pressure and everything yeah. else. Yeah. How, do, how do you show up in your personal life after seeing all this for the last couple decades? Or I guess um, That's a heavy question. You know, I, can't, I can't say that I've always dealt well with it. The human stories were important, but I was just I was going for perfection of, right. of the craft. Just, you were trying to be a, yeah. a precise surgeon, just yeah. trying to remove it and heal, uh, fix it. Yeah, and... and and then, and then you weren't as connected to the human stories. You were just like, let yeah. me. I wouldn't say I was disconnected, but right. the 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 sec the uh, from the fifth to the tenth year, approximately, when the craft became uh, occupied less of my uh, my mind because mm -hmm. you was more uh, automatic. Obviously, everyone's specific, but right. it's more automatic. I was in a rhythm. Yeah, and um, and actually enjoyed the challenge. Uh -huh. uh, and that's what you want as a cancer surgeon who's trying to be the best for you and be the best for them at this craft. And that's an interesting intersection. They want me to be the best. Yeah. They want me to have ambition at being the best surgeon, right. which means tackling the biggest cancer and my the people who chose me to perform their surgery have the fewest complications. Mm -hmm. Biggest mountain, fewest complications. That, that's a personal ambition that aligns with what the cancer patients wanted. So that, that was an interesting thing. Um, you know, it was... It drove me, and at the same time, I could see that uh, since I take care mostly of stage four cancer and there's no stage five. Really? That Stage that five means what? There is no stage five. That means death. Okay. So, so stage four is, the word terminal is not fair, but stage four is the most advanced cancer. So all my patients live a few years. Let's just say that. But that means, you know, after a while, you know, I was like, I, there's, I've cared for like, over a thousand people and they're no longer alive. Wow. And it started to mess with my head, man. And um, Because stage four, there's no way to cure it, is what you're saying. Stage four, by definition, other than in blood cancers, is not curable. So the question is, can we, can we get can out we a few years? Extend life, mm -hmm. yes. And, and quality life during that time.
Oh my that's gosh, what I mean about man. The yeah. So after a while, I was like, man, I got a, I got a, I got a drawer full of um, invitations to funerals. From oh Fat my gosh. And I just stood back a little bit, and I was having some struggles with my own in my own life. And uh, so, so the answer to your question is, for those, for those who are involved in cancer care, to um, to make yourself vulnerable to, to actually um, sort of in piecemeal go on their difficult journey with them. It can be hurtful. It mm. was raw. The last five years, though, the last three years, I've been able to take that and write about it and see that, like, I have been fortified by, by letting them teach me and the privilege of them saying, come along with me in my difficult times. This airplane must crash and you will ride with us. I, we choose you to ride with us, but you have the parachute at the end. And after a while, I was to tell my kids that, man, I just feel like I'm, I'm, doing, I'm crashing a lot of planes. And so it went from not noticing it to noticing it and having it mess with me to, wait a second, that might have been the biggest gift of my craft is to learn from the people in their most difficult times and how they remain optimistic wow. in the face of calamity. So I, I'm in a different space about it the last couple of years. Um, but that that's probably the best question anybody's asked me in the last couple of years. Wow, man, I appreciate man. it. But. Of course, man. Wow. So how do you personally manage your mind and your brain health mm. knowing that, I mean, is there, is there any, I guess, survival rate after mm. a few years of any patient that you work on? A few, yeah. So maybe it's a it's more of a stage three cancer, I guess, or it's... Yeah, yeah. The earlier so, stages have, have, have cure, cure potential. Yeah. But when they come to see me, You're at the stage it's usually four that it's spread to the brain from a, a cancer in the body that's, gotcha. that's broken out. Gotcha. And is there no way to see, to do a surgery on a brain that has less cancer at stage mm -hmm. one or two and, and, and remove it fully? Is that possible? Some. Or so, is it hard to see that? Yeah. Well, it's, there's two types of brain cancers. One that grow from the flesh of the brain and they come in different stages and more commonly are those that spread to the brain. Uh, Jimmy Carson or, uh, uh, excuse me, Jimmy Carter, president, uh, is 90 something and he's got melanoma that's in the brain, but it was, you know, so mm -hmm. it's not always, but for breast cancer or lung cancer that spreads to the brain, it's sort of the, uh, the, the, the final manifestation of the cancer's spread. Oh, man. Now, but those are heroic stories to me, right? That, oh, man, that, that, oh, that man. look you gave me, that was me f five, six, seven, eight years ago. Like, man, this is, yeah, you know. But the last couple of years, it's, man, they made it to the graduation. They made it to, you know, moms are always like, I just want to get to where my kid is out of high school. And there's some, These are there's, kids with it? No, moms uh -huh. who have breast cancer oh, in their they 40s, their they got a kid oh, in 15-year-olds you know, oh, in ninth grade. And they're, oh. But so when you see them, it's, uh, like I said, it's, I don't, it's not sad at all for me anymore. Right. It's actually how rare of a gift that I can see people at their most valiant. Oh, my gosh. Right? And it, so now, now it informs me. But back to your original question, there, there was about five years where it was just messing with my mind. You know. How does someone, this is more of a educational question, I guess, for people. How does someone prevent cancer? Mm. You know, and, and where does most of these cancers come from? Is it random that people just get it if they're whatever genetics? Mm. Is it their environment, their levels of stress, their food intake? Mm. Is it you know, anxiety that they're dealt with, trauma that they're not processing? What is the the cause of most cancer? There are cancers we potentially give ourselves from our bad choices. Really? Give me, give me Smoking. Example. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, but not everybody that smoke gets it. Right. And 20% of lung cancer people never smoke. So, really? Right. Then where, there's, do they, where do they get lung cancer from if they're not smoking? So, uh, do you remember I was talking about the brain being this garden and stuff yes. like that? Well, our bodies, they're not an interesting garden in my opinion, you know, but they're, they're a garden too. Their yeah. skin is shedding off, uh -huh. liver cells grow. So when things grow, they can sprout weeds. So air, parts of the body that don't ever change, like strangely, heart never gets cancer. Hmm. You know, so things that don't change don't sprout cancers. It's a byproduct of constantly 
having cells in our bodies die and regrow. And when you do that regrowth pro process, you're going to spin off something that doesn't behave. So when, how do you spin off things that are healthy and, uh, you know, flourishing the, as opposed to little mm -hmm. weeds here and there? How do you, how do you, well, you're do doing your both. Best? How do you do your, oh, so well, what, I'm talking about physiologically yeah. before we get to the mind. Yes. Thoughts, it's an interesting point. The, thoughts can be thought of that way too. Uh, the body, when it, um, is 99% of the time is doing the right thing. We're, we're both here. But when you do it with the sheer volume of a lifespan and oh. you do it over 7 billion people, you're going to sprout some cancers. So you get yes. cancers in the body, cancers in the brain. Can our thoughts become cancerous? That's a provocative. Uh, and can our thoughts heal cancer? That's a very provocative thought. I have not seen um, positive thinking. There's no, I'm not saying it's not possible. And I encourage people to do it. But I think positive thinking, um, meditating, um, optimi cultivating optimism, all of these things, they do change the global physiology of your body. Okay, I think we were not just the brain, but the body. Right, and that in turn can affect what's going on in the brain. Mm. But I don't know if a thought can send an electrical zap to a tumor and hurt the tumor. But a certain way of thinking can make you have a certain physiologic response, sure. which there in turn could, you know, get in the way of cancer's progression. That's why, I mean, I feel like if we're, if we're breaking this down from what I'm hearing you say, there's a garden in our brain. Mm -hmm. There's a garden, right? And how... Think of it as a garden. Oh, think of it as a garden or a school mm -hmm. of fish, you know, Dynamic, working in harmony. Throbbing. and Yeah, yes. all these different things, right? So if our... If we have a level of thinking that is, let's call it positive, mm -hmm. let's call it beautiful thinking as, a, as opposed to suffering-based thinking, beautiful thoughts, joy, gratitude, happiness, mm -hmm. peace, appreciation, acknowledgement, mm -hmm. self-love, and love for others. Let's say those types of thoughts versus the, the opposite, of suffering type thoughts. If we have those thoughts on a consistent basis in the mind, would those then in fact penetrate the brain to flourish more healthy uh to nurture that part of yeah, the garden the, the 100 billion mm. jellyfish f floating yeah, in harmony would good. they be in more harmony and healthier as opposed to penetrating it with these suffering based thoughts mm. and then in return with the brain activated and flowing and not having these breaks and blocks then it's signaling down to the body to send a more healthy mm -hmm. uh, ecosystem like throughout the body and then returning the body back to the brain and back to the yeah. mind and having a more... Let me unpack that for yes. you because I've got... That's an enormous question that I think I have a very specific yes. answer because I think when we were talking about this earlier, language can be confusing uh -huh. if, it's, if it's used too casually. But let, let's... Let's take the cancer part out for now. Yes. Um, but, but yeah, being in a better frame of mind, exercising, eating right, Sleeping. being calm, stress, yeah. all of that changes things physiologically that make your whole body better at fighting cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, that we, we agree on, that's measured. Now, let's go back to the brain uh, as a garden. Yes. So it, can we cultivate uh, that part of the garden or can we cultivate a garden that lean towards a positive mind frame? Right? Yes. Because if if bombs are falling, even the most optimistic garden will go into right. a threat response. Right. You don't all, you don't only want to be chill. You don't only want to be positive. You want to be aware. You want to be yeah. You want to be flexible. You right. want to be all these things. So let's say there is an external stress around, yet you're too jacked up. Mm -hmm. You're too stressed. That's a common ailment of city life, at least mm -hmm. here where we have safety. This is really fascinating. It's one of my favorite things that I, that I love talking about. Uh, you remember we talked about the reptilian brain? Uh-huh. Uh, you get knocked out and stay, you stay awake. And then we talked about the mushroom canopy. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another one in the middle called the limbic system, but I call it the emotional brain. Categories are not that simple, but it's got its own little anatomy. Like if there was a slice down the side of my head, uh -huh. you would actually see the mushroom canopy, you'd see some unique Star Wars looking structures in the middle 
and then you'd see the reptilian brain. Like, the stem. Yeah, the stem. The stem brain is the stem. reptilian, reptilian right. brain, and in the middle is the limbic system, mm -hmm. and on top is the mushroom. Right, that's the cortical, we, we call it the cortical canopy. We used, uh, we use like ecological terms to uh -huh. describe it in journals. Yeah. So the cortical canopy and that emotional brain, the limbic system, they have branches towards each other, uh -huh. measurable. And so when somebody goes from age 16 to being wild, to being 18 and more composed, let's say adolescence, the structure of the brain hasn't changed. It weighs the same, it looks the same on MRIs. But the person's totally different, right? Why? Well, because of the cultivation of thought from the cortical canopy, the mushroom cap, to the emotional brain, as they integrate more, you're able to say, hey, maybe don't run across that freeway, or right, right. maybe wear that seat belt. So it, 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 it's learning. It, it's, but it's interacting with emotions. At the same time, you don't want to be emotionless. Mm -hmm. So emotion is making a push back to thought. Like, no, love is an emotion. This pain I'm feeling because mom is sick is an emotion. I don't want to be Spock about it or tamp it down. So that cultivation of mm -hmm. thought and emotion is what is, is the, the most lush way to live because then you're adaptive to stress, like, hey, this is actually something dangerous going on, thought is coming Let's in, be aware. emotion yeah. is going on. But at the same time, you have this internal, what they call emotional regulation, like nothing's wrong and you're just freaked out. And that's where those branches, thought, meditation, therapy, counseling, uh, hugging your puppy, it, it creates a better balance between thought and emotion. Mm. And that, that tone, not on off. Thanks for asking this question. I love this. The tone is what life is about. You know, you 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 become a new parent. Let that let that emotion run rampant. Cry. You're about to go see your boss, and you know it's not going to go well. And you're starting to do things that you know is emotion running rampant. Then use thought and breathing exercises. Turn the to, volume down. Just, yeah. just set the tone a little different on that and then go and see your boss or your mm -hmm. lover or some conflict situation you're in. That is what we're doing throughout life. And the example of it is adolescence where it happens most, for most of us automatically, but then we stop like we're grown ups. Mm -hmm. that, <laughs> that, that tone is something you cultivate through the experiences of life. And then when you get older or when the next trauma comes, mm. you're, you're better braced and positioned for how to cope with this. A little more thought because I'm running hot on emotion or like, man, I'm too cold about this right now. It is a raw situation. I need a safe place to let my emotions run wild. Right, a safe environment, yeah. That's, that's the way I approach uh, the intersection of thought and emotion. Yeah, I think uh, you said it, emotional regulation, I feel like is... For me, one of the most powerful skills mm -hmm. that someone can learn in relationships, in career, in driving, you know, on the street with other people around. The emotions are dominant, by the yes. way. Yes. Which is great. But, but, but so learning, it's usually emotional regulation, yes. not thought regulation. Right. But learning how to have emotional regulation mm -hmm. is such a powerful skill for each individual. Um, and we're never done because mm -hmm. you don't know what's coming. Right. But it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the tending to the garden. Yes. It's the lifelong cultivation because um, what's happening if we allow our emotions, the limbic part of the mm -hmm, brain is mm -hmm, the emotion-based mm -hmm. part of the brain. Thought is the... No exact regions, but there is some right, anatomy right, right. relative. Gotcha, but yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm with it's you. the more of the main mm -hmm. focus of the brain. Obviously, if it was taken out, it would regulate. But um, if regulation. the emotion is... If you're always in reaction mode, mm. you see something, ah, you're in freak-out mode, you're in scream mode, you're in I'm a mm. defensive attack mode, you're, I'm in someone's hurting me mode, if you're always in that space, what happens to the brain uh, physiology? What, mm. what happens to the actual physical aspect of the brain and how does that affect the body mm. and the mind if your emotions are always running high? Oh, I, I love this question, Matt. Because this, when I was reading Let's about- go. Let's go, let's nah, go. Nah, I'm all like, <laughs> No, because this is, this, is what, this, is what can, this is what can empower people uh -huh. is an understanding of, of how things lean. Yeah and how things that can be modified. Yes. Otherwise, it's just, I, mean, I can't tell my cancer patients, just 
Try not to stress out. Right. It's just, it's hollow. Yeah. It's shallow. It's rude, actually. Yeah. So I think there's too much of that advice going on. What I want to show people is how we're sort of designed, our natural inclinations, and then you come up with your approach. I'm telling you, how can my, my, my son got a puppy in the pandemic? That, man... That's my therapy dog. I didn't even understand the con. I hugged that animal. And you brought so much and peace and love. You just what I'm telling you, my physiology changes. Calm. Just ha Yeah. It just, so everybody's got to have an individual approach to that. So here's the two things about emotions. There's, uh, we could cut out the thinking, just to put it coarsely. Yes. We could cut out the thinking brain and you'll still be alive. You, if you somehow were able to take out that middle part of the brain, there is no life left. There's, the consciousness relies on, on emotions. Things, on emotions. Consciousness relies on I emotions. Think, yeah, because we, we, they, they spark through, right? Remember the branches, uh-huh. frontal lobe, deeper branching, intersecting the global waves of electricity. That's why there's something called deep brain stimulation. Just let me riff on this for Go a little for bit. Go for it. So, what well, we want people to not uh, wash their hands 150 times a day or have Tourette's, or sometimes depression, or sometimes a drive for obesity, or certain tremors, we take a little catheter, and just the tip isn't covered in in, in plastic, and we put it into the emotional... Come not, on, the limbic brain. The limbic brain. You stick it down through the top of the mushroom. It, what do you call it, the cortisol? Cort- cortical canopy, yeah. Cortical you canopy. Can punch, you can punch you through that. You can punch through that, and it doesn't affect... You it. guys can look it up, deep brain stimulation, DBS. It's around for 40 years. Yeah, yeah. So but, you put it through... So those drives that, uh, like, Tourette's, uh, Depression. OCD, we, we don't tickle the cortical, the thought. You're not we just have, tapping it's the an top. Emotion, it's an emotional drive. Oh, my gosh. So you're sticking it in through the middle of the brain, and what happens? And then the tip, with just a little pulse, like the brain's pacemaker, and it changes the electric... It's, it's, no it's not It's not brand new. <laughs> I understand, but... It, but it, so why would so it you work? Can, you can pulse the, the limbic brain? Mm-hmm. How long Just, do you do this for? Five minutes, an hour? What is this process? They, they wear it under their... They wear, they wear it under their uh, clavicle like Come you would... A pa- like grandma with a pacemaker Come or grandpa? On. So you keep it in all the time? Yeah. It's, you were right here. <laughs> and what, what do you do? I mean, do you just push it, a it, button when you're freaking out and it kind of relaxes you? Or? So the waves on that lake... Yeah. If I also jumped in on the other side, uh-huh. when those waves come towards each other, sometimes they negate each other, right? Uh-huh. Similarly, the right electrical pulse can reset the electrical waves in your brain that we were talking about earlier. That's how deep brain stimulation has worked for 40 years. So how do we create deep brain stimulation on our own? Oh, that's a good question. Let me let me fa- answer the first one. I'll yes. come back to that. Deep brain stimulation on our own is through paced breathing. Let's get back to that one. Breathing, meditation. Yeah. And, I'll show you, and I'll show you the anatomy for that. But Because, mm. uh, you know, as we talked about, I need, to, I need somebody to explain it to me. I can't yeah. just say, do this. Emotional regulation is tricky in two ways. Hot emotions lead to high heart rate, surging blood pressure, lots of things being released. We've already heard about them. So you're running your body in overdrive for no reason. You're wearing yourself out. That right. makes sense to people, okay? That's a good reason to be physiologically not stressed if you can and you come up with your coping maneuvers. Mm-hmm. What's more interesting is with the intersection of the, uh, the frontal lobes, the thinking brain, and the emotional brain is that emotions are they're coming in favored. They're always hot. This, the thinking <laughs> brain has to do more of the work. And at some point, if you are not able to cultivate emotional regulation, it becomes a feed forward thing because the connections start to sever. And then you start having this emotional brain that's no longer being tamped down or paced or controlled by the thinking brain. So emotional regulation is the life skill to deal with the trauma coming up, Mm -hmm. to, to rev your body down. But if you don't try to cultivate it, you'll actually lose control of it. And as you get older, you'll have more rampant, uncontrolled emotions and not, not be approaching life the way you want to. So that's the wow. answer about emotional regulation. Do emotions have more power over thoughts or thoughts have more power over emotions? We start off with uh, the you know, emotions are generally on overdrive compared to thought. So thinking through emotions, thinking which emotions have earned the right to be there is that lifelong process and people mm-hmm. are like what, what does that mean well take adolescence mm-hmm. teenager goes from 15 to 19 very different person yeah 
And that's all emotional regulation, right? Uh-huh. Uh, thought was losing. Teenagers, yes. I miss it actually, it was a wild time. Yeah. But then thought comes into balance emotion. Your reflection and yeah. thinking. And, yeah. So take that thing that you know happens, take my explanations if, they, if they're of value to you, and then say, let me, now let me take the wheel of that thing that happened without me actually choosing or driving, right? That maturity happens on its own. Now let me take the wheel of that process and try to do it for the rest of my life, every right. year, every moment, and not just say, hey, whatever I got at 18, 19 is, is who I am. Going back to your first thing, you're new every day. So it's a responsibility to cultivate that emotional regulation through thought and through certain behaviors wow. uh, for our whole life because you never know what's going to happen. Pandemic, war, and you want to... Uh, you know, you want to be best braced for that and, mm-hmm. and not approach that as a 15-year-old. Right. You want to have more awareness and, I don't know if you want to call it control, but I think mm-hmm. you want to have control over your emotions and not let your emotions control you yeah, to you do control something Control the ride stupid. a little bit. Control the roller coaster a little exactly. bit. Trim the sails. So that, that the emotions are mostly based in the limbic part of the brain, right? Obviously, it's all connected in certain areas, but if you're talking about an area. And so what's the best way to train the emotional part of the brain, so so that we are in, we have a personal power over it. That yeah, we're in that's control. A good like that, that we that we have, or uh, or, or more. Yeah, I mean, it we, depends on the situation. We can turn it up or turn it down, and we depending are on the aware. depending on the what's going on. Yeah, maybe we need to be a more emotional in a moment and not be chill and relaxed when yeah. there's an attack. But maybe the moment is so big, man. It's of course you're just emotionally yeah. over the top, and we know that's what's been going on the last couple of years and even today. So, but that, but that leaves you a, a flexibility, and it also leaves you without feeling bad. Like, oh, yeah. I was emotional then. Now I'm not an emo- I, I'm not a person that has emotional regulation. You don't have this brain the same forever. It's a constant trimming of the sails, wow. modulating tone. To me, it's a little bit of work if you're in a good spot. Like, hey, don't this ain't guaranteed. Yeah. But it's also so much power and opportunity that if you're if you're uh, not in a good spot, like tomorrow can be better. And if not tomorrow, then the month or the year after, right? So emotional regulation, um, the shortcut. So now we're getting to like, is there a tip, you know? Because mm-hmm. I, I hope people feel like, wait a second, this everything is possible, but it's going to take a lot of work, okay? That's really what I was trying to get at for the first part. But are there shortcuts? Mm-hmm. Because I love shortcuts. Well, LA freeways or whatever. <laughs> right, ways uh, is good, yeah. <laughs> but there are there is one that has stood the test of time and that I can now explain to you based on, on things that we do as surgeons. Uh, and that's, I refer to it as meditative breathing in, in, in my first book, but really it's, it's pacing your breath. And so what does and that this is do? something you study with actual right. uh, scans or? No, no, no. It, it's even it's wilder than that. This? If you have aberrant brain electricity and we check a scan and there's some funky marble type tuft of brain tissue that doesn't look right, we know like that's the epicenter. That's where the, that's where the electricity is sprouting from. But some people that have it, some kids that have it, some adults that have it, there isn't, a, there isn't anything wrong with the scan, right? Yeah. The scan looks pretty. Brain looks perfect. But the electricity's off, right? That's what epilepsy is. All right, that's yet seizures. another proof. Mm-hmm. Seizures. Yeah. One seizure, uh, two seizures is epilepsy, then you get the diagnosis. But yes, seizures is aberrant electrical acti- activity of the brain. The same mm-hmm. things we've been talking about. Um, so when we don't know where it's sprouting, uh, because if it's from a small space, we can dissect it out and take away the, the epicenter, right? You can take the it out. You mean you can cut take, it out? We can cut it out. Wow. And the patients are seizure free. Really? Yeah. Now, but what if there isn't a spot that we find and their seizures are horrible and it's well before thinking about removing half the brain? So what they we would do is we make a reverse question mark incision. Mm. It's just scalp. It's not very tender. Yeah, yeah. That's what they tell me. Yeah. Tell me under the, ribs are more tender yeah, is what I'm they sure. say. Uh, patients. Then we make our little ice fishing hole. We take, are, they, are they numb when they're taking this, this off? This, this for work? this one, they're asleep. There's others that okay. are awake. Do you numb the skull, the skin? You just cut through the skin, no numbing. They're, they're fully asleep. Oh, but when they're awake? Then at the very end, I inject the cut. So with, the numbing lasts the longest. With numbing, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, You're not just sitting there awake and they're just cutting it off. <laughs> that's, that is an operation we do, but that's a wow. different story. Yeah. The, so you take the skull off. Yeah. Uh, the brain has a covering. You don't see the brain right away. There's like a sheath. Um, like a, like, like a skin? Like no, a, it's like almost a nylon material. You can pick really? it up and stitch it. That's what keeps the water inside the skull. It's, the, it's not the bone. It's a sack. Yeah. Brain sack. There you go. It's a brain sack, right? It's like but a it's sack. nylon. It's pretty. And we cut it. And then the clear water pours out. You can see the surface of the brain. The and water's coming out. Yeah, because the brain is floating in an aquarium, right? It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's buoyant. Your brain doesn't sit on bone. It's, it's floating. Again, jellyfish. In water. So when you're hitting, when you're having a lot of fast mm, actions point. and you're hitting something, is it hitting? Yeah, your skull stops and then inside it sloshes your, into the inside. That can't be good for you, is it? Well, that's where all the CTE and football stuff is the issue. Is and it's a sudden stops, repeated sudden stops with the brain sloshing and hitting the inside surface of your skull. That can't be good, can it? Well, people are pretty, people get by, but we're seeing that if you do it too much, yeah. as with kids and NFL people, but... So you got it open, then there's a little, it's the size of a deck of a card. It's got a little 96 or different electrodes on it. You put the deck of the card on the naked brain. You take those wires, you pop them out with little needles through the back, almost like, like crazy. yeah. And then you put the bone back on and you stitch up the scalp and then you put some numbing medicine and you, you put, put on a head wrap and they hang out in the hospital for weeks. Because you're waiting for the seizure so you, to happen. So you've got a pad on the brain. A grid. So when the seizure sparks, we can see uh, it was it was Shut like in up. Connect Four or Battle. Battle right. was that was that board game? <laughs> Battleship. Battleship. Yeah. yeah, it's in it's in two. You know where it's at. Yeah, you know where it's at. Two six. Because that way you, you know where you're gonna. Dissect. So there's a there's a mesh uh, mm -hmm. pad, mm -hmm. electromagnetic pad or something that can track mm -hmm. with wires that are mm -hmm. coming out of the back of this. This connected to the monitor. Uh, that are connected to the monitor at yeah. all times. Mm -hmm. And they're there for a couple weeks. <laughs> it's insane to me. Because they're, they're trying functional. To figure, they're happy. They're fine. They're like, like us. Hanging out. Yeah. Like, give me Playing some ice cream. Games. Play some video games. Watch some TV. So what happened was a bunch of the wires PhDs. coming out of their necks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, the scalp. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. we have things. People, you know, you'd be surprised with what we can. You wrapped we, it up. What kind of devices we put in and dangle from people. That's cool. Like, you know, from broken legs, they come up with those little metal grids and they move around. So so then after a few weeks, you you wait till a seizure happens. Mm -hmm. And then we know where under that grid where it's where it sparked. We found the epicenter. And then from that, you track the data. You have the recording of the data, and then you can go in and then yeah. what? Tweak it, or you remove, remove that little it. part. That's it. And then they're done. They don't have seizures anymore. Sometimes, wow. or they're reduced. Now here's something that's more interesting for for you and your audience. Well, that's a boring couple of weeks. So a bunch of cognitive <laughs> science students and brain students and all they come in and they started hanging out with them, and they said, "Hey." Can we go through these lessons of paced breathing and meditative breathing? Uh huh. Can we do this without no. removing it? Yeah. Well, completely unrelated to the clinical uh -huh. work, uh -huh. well, we're hanging. I've got a direct feed of the true electricity oh, from the surface of your naked while brain. While they're breathing. Yeah. Let's. While they're sitting there, so they do something new with them. They teach them meditative breathing. Come on. What is, what, is, what are you seeing on the, the brain activity recordings? The same thing that we see when we give Valium, which is an anxiolytic. Their anxiety level goes down. Their electricity goes from fast to medium. Remember we started this? Uh -huh. And we're talking about athletes not wanting to be in fast. Right. We want to be in the flow state. Meditative breathing led to direct changes in the electricity of their brain as measured, not with a sticker on the forehead, but with a grid on the surface of the naked brain. It's on true, the brain. It's true measurable changes in the electricity there for the mind. So meditative breathing that for thousands of years people have said can help you chill out, is an anxiolytic and break anxiety. Well, we have proof of that now. And I think that's important for people to know that it's not just some, you know, it's just not a concept that's being thrown around too casually that through awake, um, direct electrophysiologic recording of seizure planning surgery at elite centers uh, while looking for the seizures. There's a lot of data coming out about let, let's play video games. Let's do meditative breathing. Let's read. Wow. And then what changes? And so that's what I love in book one that I shared was that's raw data. That's real data. And there's an explanation behind how that happens. And so what I would say to people is that's something you have that's free. Because I'm not selling right. anything. Breathing. And the pace of breathing. And 
What's it's the pace that works best? I mean, there's lots of different techniques of meditative so breathing. I, they found, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You know, people say through your nose or mouth, and that's kind of the confusing stuff that's out there. Well, the nose and the mouth connect before they get to the trachea and it goes to your lungs. So it doesn't matter how, but it's about slowing the cadence and making the cadence more methodical. A deep breathing you know, deep breath in and a deep breath out. It's no different than what we do in surgery when you feel the case getting a little out of your control. What do you do? Well, I, I first the first thing is I just slow my breathing down. And that doesn't mean the solution will arise, but I know that puts me in my most calm wow. and focused state to find the solution for the problem in front of me. And yeah. likely that's what athletes that thrive do as well. You don't want your brain surgeon to be like, <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly. Like, but that's what stress does. It makes yeah, you hyperventilate, right? Absolutely. But if you just, that's that's a great point. If you just hyperventilate just because you're just doing it as just whatever, for whatever reason, you get physically jittery. Yeah. You will give yourself anxiety by just doing that. Yeah, I thought that just for a second. Well, I'm, I'm showing you the proof on the other side. Do the opposite of hyperventilation and you'll make yourself less frenetic. Will that solve your relationship problems? No. I'm not sure. Will that make you not want to get in a fight with your boss? I'm not sure. But you should know that that puts you at your most in command of your emotions, your mm. emotional regulation. That's a great, great Gosh, question. For the me emotional there. regulation, it sounds like a big part of the, the, the health or the lack of health of mm. our brain and our bodies is what I'm hearing you say. The emotional regulation is at the center of our potential let's call it sprouting of healthy mm -hmm. uh, brain activity and connections and also healthy cells throughout the body and organs or a lack of emotional regulation could potentially damage the brain activity or it could have it so up and down as opposed to a calmer activity and the body as well to create potentially more I don't want to call it cancerous mm. cells, but you wear yourself out yeah. if you let the emotions Exhaustion, run too hot. stress, anxiety, yeah. Yeah. depression, all these different yeah. things. You wear yourself out. What I'm hearing you say is emotional regulation is at the core of these things. I think so. And, and it's the rarest skill to cultivate and the most important one. And it's in your control. And But it's not easy. It's not easy. It's taken me a long time to learn this process. So we've got thoughts. Do thoughts come from the brain or from the mind? <laughs> that question, that, that's a deep question. Um, and, and is the mind, but the mind is only activated when the brain is activated. It's right? like saying, does the roar come from the person in the stadium, you know, or is it its own thing? You, you need the neurons to, to roar to connect mm -hmm. with electricity to have the mind. The mind is that roar outside of the, sta of the stadium. Interestingly, they, they tried to, they did this experiment again with direct, like, if I need some, I need hard science. I don't, yes. want, I don't want fluffy language. Somebody says, in the next five minutes, decide, to, decide on your own, at your own, whatever you want, that you're gonna move, you're gonna grab this coffee cup. Uh -huh. And then they're measuring <laughs> me. The electricity pops before I report wanting to move this coffee cup. What do you mean? Meaning that that the electricity happens before... You make a move. Uh, before I think I'm ready to make a move. You know, the ambition comes from the electricity. It's not like, I'm gonna grab this coffee cup and then electricity. It's the electricity, I think I'm gonna grab this coffee cup. Really? Yeah. So this is something you... That I can't... Yeah, you it can, comes first. You've scanned this, you've mm -hmm. seen this. More than scan. Right? Because a lot of brain scans going on these days. Uh -huh. Everybody in a car accident with a headache is getting a brain scan. I'm talking about direct electrical measurements. You mean with on the brain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the, so, so, the, the so electricity wait, is the thought. So before I move my hand to grab this coffee cup, there's an electrical... I can measure, I can measure a little flick like your light bulb. I can uh -huh. measure something before without you telling me when. So, so, so you, you can tell me when I'm going to move for it. Based well, on the I can tell you when electricity changes. I can't tell you your intentions. I can't read your mind. Gotcha. But the electricity pops before you actually think I'm having a thought. The electricity is <laughs> you having the thought. <laughs> what does that mean? It's I don't crazy. Know. <laughs> but that's measurement that we can that we can we can uh, you know it's uh, that's why it's fascinating the inner you know let me tell you something about this man. <laughs> the electric we are electrical 
beings. Yes. Like eels and right. You can the nerves to your legs. You can put electrode in there. You know, we're we're electric. Um, we're flesh. We have chemistry, right? Electrochemistry. Like a, there's a battery, um, and you separate these little ions. And what's what's a battery? We are batteries. Are those neurons are essentially batteries? They're things that are separated that currents can run through. And people say, oh, man, that sounds so, I know, I said, I know, we're measuring it. Seizures are aberrant electrical activity without any changes in brain anatomy. I'm trying to get people out of flesh, people out of being wired to electrical flows. And then think about this. In a bipolar disorder, when you can be really manic or really depressed, the treatment is an ion, lithium. So really? The, it's... It's for bipolar. A, mm-hmm. Wow. And for decades. It's on the periodic t- uh, table next to all the other ones like hydrogen. And it's an ion. It's, it's stardust. Stardust, <laughs> lithium, is cheap. Right. It's a pill and it can bring down your mania and it can lift your depression. Really? So there are, I'm seeing a oh lot gosh. of different things that point to... Uh, that we are electrical flows, uh-huh. our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions and behaviors. Because that's what we're talking about today, right? Like the bigger stuff. Um, not how do I move an arm or how right, do I move right, a leg. Right, right, right. And again, um, if, you see, if you see your thoughts as billowing through your skull, um, if you see them moving like aurora borealis, like a school of fish or birds, mm-hmm. that, that leaves us with potential that uh, we can think differently. We can feel differently. Yeah. Um, that we can transform. That that takeaway is for you to make, but I'm trying to give you a lot of evidence that the world of neuroscience is starting to see things that way yeah. um, and not about gears or wires. So how do we train our brains and our minds to live a more abundant life? You know, everybody's got their own drive. I mean, I've got people who don't like to be on lithium because they think they're more creative when they're manic, you know? Mm. So I'm not, I can't, I don't judge, um, I inform. Yeah. It's ev- up to people what they want to do. But if I you, guess abundant and peaceful, loving life, you know, it's yeah. like all that. Well, I mean, I, if that's your ambition, I think you would, you know, because it isn't for some, actually, mm. they want a wildlife or they want to, right. you know, they're, you know, they take risks, they climb mountains, they're, they like the thrill, you know, it, I don't, uh, that's up to you. But to optimize brain function, I think in whichever direction you want to steer it is to first look at the flesh because it is flesh. And so keeping the arteries open and irrigating that garden, that flesh is important. Mm. So things good for your heart, keep the arteries open in your brain. You know, you want blood flow going. You want water going in your garden. That's easy enough. And you get that through how? Uh, the same things that uh, keep your heart arteries open. Exercise. So, uh, exercise has double benefit, but yeah, but you know, you're, if you're my age, 49, cholesterol pills, you know, you got to keep the plumbing open. Uh-huh. Exercise, eating right, keeping your cholesterol down. All those things they tell you so you don't get a heart attack. Well, keeping those arteries open on the surface of your heart also keep these arteries open to the, into, the, into the garden of your brain. So that's easy for people to get. Like, okay, heart health is good for brain health. Well, heart health is good for brain flesh. Mm. Well, we are more than flesh, right? Mm-hmm. And so then you have to leave the world of, of heart behind um, and come more into sort of the mind. Then there's thinking mm-hmm. thoughts, mm-hmm. not just brain yeah. health, but thinking health. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Exactly. Because uh, it's not a pump, you know? Right, it's thought health. Yeah, yeah I like that. And now, before we get to the electricity up here that we've touched on a lot, We've talked about now heart health is good for brain flesh health. Yes. There's something in between that we haven't touched, and that's the chemi- that there are chemicals, neurotransmitters, often used. I hate the word, you know, but dop- oh, it's a dopamine hit. It's not that simple. Um, so now there's chemicals there, too. So in this garden, the piece that I didn't tell you about is that those 100 billion neurons, when they are trying to branch with each other, when successful, uh, they never actually touch. There's always going to be a gap. And in that gap, they spray chemicals at each other. So you have electricity coming down this neuron, and to get across this cleft to the other neuron, it sprays dopamine, it sprays serotonin, it sprays other things, GABA. And so you are electrochemical. And that's why things like Prozac as an antidepressant Mm. is out there. Um, 
That's where lithium works. You can change the global electrical pattern and flows of your brain by modifying the chemistry in those little clefts. Mm -hmm. So we'll give you a specific example, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. A lot of people are antidepressants. When serotonin is sprayed, the reuptake inhibitor is a little vacuum and it doesn't clear the cleft of serotonin. You're messing with the vacuum so there's more serotonin in the cleft uh -huh. that tends to work as an antidepressant. So mm. chemicals have to be thought about also. There's the flesh, there's the chemistry, and then there's the electricity. What seems to help everything, uh, and people aren't going to like this answer, but it is, is uh, exercise. Right, yeah, of course. <laughs> and exercise on a, uh, in a way where you're also thinking. There are these cool things like they had people running on a treadmill and and dodging wild game as oh, wow. like a video like thought you know thought and movement together um, so like a i mean like a the, racket sport where you're like yeah. hand-eye coordination you have to move ping pong pick tennis pickleball is amazing i just started playing last year <laughs> i've only yeah. played like five times well, i'm like this is an incredible sport i played with my sons we we're dropping them off in san francisco dude. for berkeley and we they got it i hadn't played dude and my my so son's fun. like, this is why, Dad, you don't play board games with us or sports with us because you're insanely competitive. Oh man, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. I was just like, okay, Dad, it's it's a fun it game, yeah, yeah. But so, but, but that's powerful, right? Yeah. Because people sitting at home don't want to hear, man. Get on your treadmill, get active, get engaged, yeah. go out and do yeah. stuff. Yeah, board games, moving, thought. So the, the thought cultivation is really important. So uh -huh. uh, brain, uh, you know, the, keeping the flesh going. But once you get out of thinking just about the flesh, it's about engagement. It's about stimulation. It's about, you know, the results don't happen the next day. It's a mm -hmm. life pattern, yeah, right? It's, it's not knowing how to play the violin, but trying to learn how to play the violin. It's not, you don't have to learn the sec next language. Right. You just got to try. You just got to try to pull from all the corners of that garden as a habit. I'm not saying hundred. I'm not saying all day, every day, but that nobody told us those habits should also be introduced. Uh -huh. Nobody told us to cultivate our thought is something kids should learn, something we should have dedicated time to. We learn learn a lot about heart health, you know. And now it's time to get onto brain and mind health, mm. especially with the pandemic, especially with with other things that are going on. Is that so I think um, when I was in medical school, it was just heart, heart, heart all the time, right? And in fact, heart surgery uh, was one of the most, the second most competitive along with brain surgery. Mm -hmm. In the last three decades, as they've gotten better with catheters and stents and the pills have been better, heart surgeons have significantly been reduced because there isn't the need for it. And I think when you look at the dent that has been made in cardiac health, through a couple of decades of messaging. And mm -hmm. I mean, you go in there, they check your blood pressure, they check all this stuff for your heart, but nobody asks you how you're doing. Right, um, the emotional, right. therapeutic side of things. Mind health. Yes. And so- So emotions is mind health. Well, I think it depends. So some people, let, let's stay with that for a second, uh -huh. it, because for some people, the lack of emotional regulation is leading them to suffer or not have the mind health they want. But they're feeling it in their body, the emotion. When you think of oh, emotions, yeah. you feel like And that book has continued is... to do well. The body keeps score. It's a clever oh, it's title a, it's too. It's amazing book. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, especially in these times, uh -huh. it's number two on the bestseller list, in New York, I mean, New York Times bestseller list. But, right. but that, that space is true. But there's also other people whose mind health is a, a lack of focus or attention. Like they feel good, they just can't get the words out. Uh -huh. And so my cancer patients that have chemo, uh, they can sometimes develop chemo fog. And there's things like you know COVID brain fog. Yes. So so yes, mind health and emotional regulation likely the the most important thing, but also other things like concentration and attention, uh, is is all under the umbrella of mind health. Mm -hmm. So like if I had a attention coach when I was younger, I could have done better in school. I see my boys, my one of them, I'm just like, you're the sharpest, you're the sharpest tool in the shed. You just can't, you know, look at a problem for longer than twenty seconds. Right, and then you're distracted. So, so stay in the stay in the striking distance. When that naturally comes to you in your twenties, mm -hmm. you're going to be the boss, man. And right. so, uh, realizing attention and focus is one part of mind health. Realizing emotional regulation is one part of mind health. Uh, realizing that if they eat a certain way, uh, and you teach them to eat a certain way, there is a there is a proven mind diet. It's Mediterranean, mostly plants, mm -hmm. fish. 
if you put these habits in them now, think about where they will be at age 49, having the tools, right. some of the tricks, uh, having had the diet that has preserved their flesh the best, likely to have staved off dementia a little bit. Like those things we do now as a lesson, in my opinion, as a lesson for the pandemic. Let's not wait to see how this pandemic has just rocked uh, kids' minds. Right. Let's put this stuff in now. Let's front load this and get in fr- and, and then let them develop and see how this how this generation happens um, after this you know cataclysmic event. As a parent of three boys, big what, boys, and, and after all the information you've learned personally from life experience, but also as a surgeon, neuro, uh, brain surgeon, and neuroscientist, if you could only share three pieces of wisdom for mm. parents today to raise their kids to have opt- an optimal life. Mm. What would you say were the three things you three things uh, they should do? The the answers I give, I want to back it with sure. the, 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 even now saying the science is, um, doesn't mean as much as it used to. The science to, is fluid. Yeah. It's like always evolving and changing. Right, I want to back it with an explanation okay. that you can understand and uh, take home and, and grasp. Um, the third thing is just what we talked about. I'd love to equip them with mind health tools. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that would be a certain type of diet. Good food. I'm not talking about being skinny or fat or heavy or obese or, or, or underweight. I'm not talking about any of those things. The things you eat, regardless of your weight, um, can help preserve the flesh of your brain. And that's the Mediterranean diet. So I would have added salmon a couple of times. And if you're vegan, um, mm-hmm. you, you could, there are vegetables that add that, that sort of omega-3s in there. Yeah. I would have said, look, this has to be a part of what you eat. Even if you're eating French fries every day, yeah, I'm not telling you what not to eat. Yeah, right. But make sure you have this at least. This, yeah. yeah, this vitamin is nature's true vitamins, uh-huh. right? For your. sort of the emotional coping skills. Um, and now we've gone over why that's important, that for these things to work, they're a multi-decade, they're a glacial process. Yeah. It's not, can, what can we take tomorrow? Can I take this pill and it'll fix everything? If there was one, I'd be taking it, I'd share it with you. I'm not yeah, against yeah. it, actually. I just, there isn't one. And when you think of the brain and the ways we've tried to conceptualize them today, you can imagine one pill ain't gonna fix all of that. Uh-huh. Um, the other thing that I find interesting is when they're born, they actually have more neurons than they hold on to. And that was one, you know, when you said in surgery, like there was an aha moment, I was like, can you do that? Well, in neuroscience, there was this one aha moment for me. It's like, they have more of those neurons, those jellyfish when they're young than when they're older. So you're born with the biggest block of marble. Wow. And you shave, you shave off what you don't use. Because the brain is an energy hog, right? So it wants to be efficient. So if you see that there will be a pruning of the diversity of neurons, mm. and then certain things will be have better connections and 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 stay in there. If you know there's a a culling coming for for the diversity of neurons, the the most broad types of neurons. Um, I think it's important to let them have the most broad types of life experiences. 
So they hold on to those as they get older, and then they can choose what they want to do and shave off a few they ain't using anymore, right? Right. So that it's called pruning. Huh. Um, okay. The human brain in kids will go through pruning. And people are like, what does that mean? Well, you know, we're born and we can't walk, and then we learn to walk, so some changes are going on. Uh-huh. The changes are also going on up here. You're born with a lot and you're shaving certain things down. Diversity of experiences, I think, uh, are very important. So I took them traveling with me all around the world, like each of them, eight trips to eight trips around the world each. Wow. Um, And that's when we did all our vibing, bonding, talking, hanging. Of course, took them to all the practices and games and stuff like Mm -hmm. that, you know, but the diversity of experiences is important to me. That, helps. that could be with grandma, with cookies, yeah, yeah. different cookies. I'm not, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be all That helps prune the brain and optimize the brain. Yeah, so that helps. Um, a diversity of experiences will keep, will let them have the, the widest repertoire of mm-hmm. neurons. As so, opposed to what, limiting their experiences? Yeah, because we'll then what? the brain will shave off the stuff it doesn't do. If you, if you tie one hand behind the back, certain neurons will, will, will fall away. So, so we want to keep those neurons as long as we can. And that's my second point. I got a buddy who's an Olympian in uh, in um, uh, in England. He's a deca- uh, pentathlete, uh-huh. Greg White, and he, he made a great point. He's, I was a decathlete in college. Oh, were you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just fascinating it was, to see. It was amazing, man. It's great. I like the. I mean, I've always tried to be sort of a, a decathlete in life. In life, like, me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be. I want to enjoy. It's not that I want to be good at a lot of different things. I want to. I want to see what it looks like when yeah. you get to be good at something. Yeah, exactly. Because you get into different worlds like this one, right? But uh, the other thing is that um, proprioception, which should be cultivated in my mind, which is the knowing your arm is up or down. And so Greg and I, we talked about it. It would be fun for everybody should play as much as to their capacity because I know people have children with intellectual or physical disabilities, but... Similarly, getting them physically is teaching them how to do somersaults, mm-hmm. putting them in a, not that they're going to be gymnasts, but. Handstands and backflips and. Uh, yeah. But some sort of sporting, they call it sporting over there, like you know, exposure. Uh-huh. So they're fully coordinated with their bodies. I think that's an important, whether that translates to less falls as grandma when they become grandparents, I don't know. But the, the full integration of of brain to physical coordination I think would be an interesting one. You know, using the mouse with their left hand, using the fork with their left hand, forcing mm-hmm. forcing those uh, those neurons to stay relevant. Right? Yes. So that's uh, in experiences, and that's in, that, number two, I would say, in movement. And then number three is, uh, you know, what we talked about is teaching them what should be eaten. I, I think mm-hmm. it's easy to say, I had this conversation with one of my sons the other day, I was like, um, Try to eat this regardless of what else you eat. Right. Um, because there are things in, in fatty fish, certain vegetables, and plants um, that's separate from the junk food, separate from all the other bad stuff you might eat or good. I mean, it's delicious, man. Happiness is important. I, I, eat some, I eat some junk food, but I have tried hard since I learned about this to... To be on the Mediterranean diet. Yeah, or to... Add, to add plants and omega threes and wow. however you want to do uh-huh. that. Wow. Um, as uh, not to lose weight, not not for all of that, but to preserve the flesh of my brain. So I think you know uh, diversity of experiences to keep your your neurons around. Um, mm-hmm. Lots of movement and coordination training to keep uh, 
to keep those neurons engaged and then um, um, eat plants yeah. to keep the flesh going. What do you feel like is, uh, I've heard from one, I've heard from different neuroscientists that, tell me if this is accurate, that the bigger your body gets, or more obese it gets, the smaller your brain becomes. It shrinks the brain. Or there's a correlation there with obesity and brain size. Is that? I haven't heard of that. Okay. And just on a regular level, I operate on patients who are obese, and when I open their skull, it, they're fine. There's, there's, there's not. Gotcha. Oh, I haven't seen that. You haven't seen smaller or bigger? Yeah. yeah. And actually, that's that can be, you know, I have seen withered brains work perfectly. Really? And I have seen juicy brains have issues with epilepsy or autism. So the flesh is the starting point, uh-huh. but it's it's the mind and the function that's Gosh, above, that's right? that's so fascinating. So trying to go, you know, if you're heavy and your brain is smaller, brain smaller, bigger, this spot, that spot. Uh, hardwired, not hardwired. I'm geared for this. Right. I just. But if you have a perfect looking, juicy brain, let's say, right? Mm-hmm. That you're like, wow, that's a beautiful looking. It looks healthy. And that's what epilepsy is. Most people, it's just beautiful looking brain, but the electricity that it's sparking is off. And sometimes they pass out. Sometimes they smell certain things. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they have visions. It's all from the electricity, right? Like that's a real life. Gotcha. Exp- I mean, there's now, stuff you... about there like authors and writers. Uh-huh. That in their before having the seizures, when they felt most connected to God, so that's an electrical thing. Their brain MRI looks the same as this brain MRI. I love these three pieces of advice you'd give to parents, which is physical optimizing the physical body with coordination type activities and and doing that. And the second one, diversity of experiences in life, just mm-hmm. providing a range of opportunities to experience life uh, at its fullest, and then nutrition. For mind health, mind health tools including mm. nutrition and emotion, emotional coping skills, and emotional regulation skills. Um, God, I feel like I could go for a few more hours with you. This stuff's fascinating to me. What do you feel like you're going to be shocked to learn over the next five years as a surgeon and a neuroscientist mm. with the capabilities of where you see the brain, mind, connect, emotional connection heading? The thing that has fascinated me recently, um, a bit out of my wheelhouse, because it doesn't require a surgeon, which is good. I'd love for my career to be obsolete. Mm-hmm. You know, if we can help people um, without having to cut them open, that's right. prevention. Yeah, yeah. Or non-invasive treatments. Like mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm trying to invent those. I'm trying to make myself obsolete. Mm-hmm. But right now, the stuff that some of the stuff, you know, the patients are, they come looking for for surgeons. Uh, I don't do the type of surgery where I try to uh, offer you improved something. People come to me with a scan or a feeling that say, can you help me? And I have to decide if I can, and I guide them through that. So I, I, I enjoy my craft, but I also want there to be a time when opening a skull is no longer needed. Mm-hmm. That said... Um, NPR did uh, so out of Stanford or Karolinska. I'm not sure, but I, I love the way science communicates. You can see the you can see the work, but the uh, transcranial and again, I, these words can be easily manipulated. So I'm trying to give you the explanation. Yes. So when you read it, when some other time, you could say, "Wait, I remember he was talking about the electricity of the brain." Uh, they have figured out the thing looks like the size of a camera and they put it, you know, it's on a frame on the outside of your skull and they pulse mild electrical currents. Not the sky high ones from shock therapy like Jack Nicholas uh-huh. in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But the fact that if you understand that we are electric, the same deep brain stimulation, the little pulse, the heavy pulse of many electrodes uh, of shock therapy, electroconvulsive therapy, the, that they can do it at more, they can turn the, 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 you know, the voltage down uh-huh. and they can direct it more. And recently, in a rigorous journal, they were able to get it down to five, most of the day sessions, and they had an 80% reduction in, in refractory depression. So you're depressed, you've taken all the pills, things are difficult, you've wow. considered 
things. Suicidal thoughts or, yeah. Well, that's, that's an interesting one. Let me get on that one for okay. just for a second. Because when, when people have suicidal thoughts and they, they go into a hospital, they can't wait six weeks for the pills to work. If they work. They need relief now. Or in five days, like with this kind of little, just the softest shock therapy. The patient's report feels like a, a woodpecker. Huh. And on so, the brain. On the brain. It, that's not something a neurosurgeon will do. But to me, that is where things are headed. Wow. I would caution, don't buy the stuff from Amazon. With the, <laughs> yeah. the gizmo, there's always a, there's always a dark so, side of being manipulated by some of these so what you're saying sci-fi is technologies. They've already been doing studies on this where 80% reduction on depression. Yeah. Powerful. From just the electronic shock, mm -hmm. a gentle, mm -hmm. for what? Well, shock therapy is for severe depression. For what, 30 minutes or five minutes? Is this an it's hour? It's 10-minute episodes spaced by time over most of the day. But, you know, you got to wow. spend some time. But five days. It's powerful. And then and then it stays, or it's for a period of time? It was a very good question. They've, some of the patients found it to be durable. Maybe in that time the pills come in. Maybe in that time the oh, therapy comes in. Interesting. But the point is... Um, and they can do it with magnets too. So be careful uh, on YouTube with magnets can do, but it's electromagnetic. So, uh, um, gosh, it's fascinating. Yeah. And it's not completely in my space. That's why right, I'm right. also more fast. Not, yeah. I'm a surgeon. I stimulate the brain. I use electric wands. I put electric pulses, but the whole space of doing it from outside the skull is a non-surgical space. But to me, it's very fascinating. <sighs> it reinforces the concept that our highest levels of thinking, feeling, and emotions are all sort of electrical flows. Oh my phenomena. gosh, this is this is my jam. I love yeah, this man. stuff, man. I'm so excited. Now, but there's a lot of room for you know. There's a lot of room for exploitation when of you course. use language like that because yeah. it's easier to say gears and wired, but it's not. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, you know, Dostoevsky wouldn't report writing his best work pre the moments preceding his epilepsy, right? That's you're talking about art and literature. Wow. Otherwise, you wouldn't put a, a little battery in the controlled medical uh, environment and break depression. And otherwise, you wouldn't, you know, be in shock therapy at still some of these centers, and it can be useful, where you, you literally bzz, you shock the skull and people wake up non-suicidal. Even if it happens once, right. all three of these things from ancient literature... Uh -huh. And the world of epilepsy, to a new study out to of, modern science, to, to modern, it's a lot. The theme that connects it all is all juicy brains, but all different people because of the electricity that sprouts from those juicy brains. Oh man, yeah. So that it's a bit to to wrap your head around, but <laughs> that's our current understanding. It'd be easier for me to come in there and say you're wired this way, you're wired that way, and change your wiring by eating a blueberry. Look, uh, it's just not. It's just not where our understanding is. This know? is fascinating, man. We're going to have to have you come back on for part two sometime. <laughs> but I want to ask you a couple final questions. Yep. Uh, this is a question. Well, actually, before I do ask you a couple final questions, I want people to check out your work. You've got a new book called Life on a Knife's Edge, A Brain Surgeon's Reflections on Life, Loss, and Survival. Um, you've got a a number of books, but people can check out that one. It's the recent one. If they go to your website is, what's your website where they can learn more about it all? Um, I would say just, I would just, you know, just Google because you see a, a lot of different things like yeah, that. Yeah. You know, my, okay. my website isn't really the conduit, but I, I'm, I'm a cancer surgeon at City of Hope. Yes. And then there's different stuff I've been doing. And, and Are you on social than, media at all? I am on Instagram, actually. That's where I put my, my good stuff. Okay, cool. So we'll follow that. That's Dr. At Dr. John Deal, yeah. John Deal, yes. J-A-N-D-I-A-L. So go check you out over there. Um, and the book's on Amazon and everywhere else. But again, check out the book, Life on a Knife's Edge. This stuff's fascinating, man. I'm, I'm so intrigued by this. I feel like in another life, I would have been a neuroscientist. Mm. Probably not a surgeon, but a neuroscientist. Because <laughs> um, I just think, yeah, surgery for me, that might be a little too much. But I don't know how you do it, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Every man. week, it's that's got to be intense. But uh, really fascinating stuff that you've been studying and practicing, and, and I want people to, to get the book and, and learn more about you. Um, how else can we best be supportive of you and what you're up to right now? I mean, this is... Um, I never take it lightly to have a voice and to share mm -hmm. my opinions. So that, right away, you've, you know... You've already done me a tremendous favor to invite me on your show, so sure. so we're all good. <laughs> um, and I think you know, 
I, I don't, you know, I don't ask for, I, there's nothing I'm selling. I don't have yeah. a, anything like that, but I'm turning 50 this year and, um, um, you know, my pops and other people I've seen, you know, this run ain't forever. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think, um, I think I'm just super happy, um, that I'm still, I'm exploring and investigating and tearing myself apart, you know, putting my soul work uh, in this mm -hmm. book and, and just to have the opportunity to, uh, to have that as a component of my life is, I never expected that. Yeah. And so by, uh, by being given that opportunity, that's support enough, brother. That's cool, man. Yeah, I'm man. excited. I'm excited for people to get the book. Uh, this question is called The Three Truths. It's a question I ask everyone at the end of the interviews. Hypothetical scenario. Imagine you live as long as you want to live, but it's your last day on earth. You've accomplished everything. You've done the stuff you want to do. You have happy, healthy life, family, all that stuff. But for whatever reason, you've got to take all of your message with you to the next place. Mm. It's your last day. You've got to turn the lights off. There's no more electricity in mm. the brain, and you move on to the next place. You take all of your work with you, all the message, the content, anything you shared, your lessons, no one has access to anymore. But you get to leave behind three things you know to be true, three lessons you would leave with the world. And that's all that we would have to remember you by are these three lessons. What would you say are yours? I think the first one would be that uh, uh, life is short, but art is long. I never fully understood that, but through the last few years where I've become an author, I've, I've realized I can impact a lot of a lot of people, and mm -hmm. that the words in this book and the the soul work in this book can actually last onward. Yeah, that's uh, cool. So life is short, but art is long, and um, having an opportunity to leave a bit of art has mm. been a tremendous opportunity, and I w that would be a message I would leave the world. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I would say is. Uh, it really touched me. I think people think he was being facetious. But Kafka said, "I think," uh, and I learned about these these you know these authors and stuff later. I never read. Actually, I didn't read much at all when I was young. <laughs> I was just rocking out, and then, um, but in the last four or five years of trying to put this, trying to talk about the human brain and mind, you have to bring in artists and mm -hmm. literature. But he said the the meaning of life is that it ends. Mm. And my cancer patients have, uh, have shown me that is. Um, when you get that feeling of um, mortality, that it can be fuel for you uh, to live. Absolutely. So, and um, and the third thing is, um, if you can, um, this one's more, more mine. If you're if you're fortunate enough to find true love, mm. um, take care of it so um, so you don't lose it. Mm. And that's on an interpersonal level between, of course, between friends and lovers and and, and parents, even you know, and the children. That's what I got, baby. Man, uh, I want to acknowledge you for a moment for putting your message out there in a way that we can understand it, because I think it's mm. it's confusing to understand the brain and the mind, and the emotions, and how it all is connected. And I think people are communicating in a way of rewiring. I've said these things. And it's understanding how do we start to change the language around this and understand the brain and the mind and the emotions and the body and the flesh and the electricity of it all. And so you, can, you doing the practical work as a surgeon and a certain neuroscientist and bringing both fields together to then educate in more simplified ways of something that's extremely complex that we'll probably never fully understand mm -hmm. how it all works. Is, is really helpful. And for me, this has just been really inspiring. So I appreciate and acknowledge your work and your ability to want to continue to grow as a human mm -hmm. and serve people with your message. It's really inspiring, man. Uh, my final question is, what's your definition of greatness? That elusive goal that no one achieves but keeps us striving for more. My man. Thanks, sir. We have to change our narrative. We have to forget what the world said about all these scary words and see those as very helpful. It's a complete 90 degree or 360 degree change. Despair, anxiety, shame, thinking I am shame, thinking I have no self-esteem, thinking I can't do this, that's okay. 